Good evening, everyone. My name is Catherine Perez. I'm a third year JD LLM student in the Entertainment Arts and Sports Law program on the Art Law Track here at UM Law. I serve as the administrator for the Hoffman Forum and have the pleasure of welcoming you all tonight to tonight's Hoffman Forum Civil Conversation entitled NFTs Changing the Game for Gaming the System. This civil conversation will explore two main questions whether the emerging NFT marketplace encourages or facilitates greater access to the primary market for historically underrepresented artists, and whether the emergence of NFTs has encouraged visual artists to cross over into new mediums of creative work. We'd like to thank two of our law school alumni, Deborah and Larry Hoffman, for their generosity in creating the Hoffman Forum, which operates under the art law track of UM Law's Entertainment Arts in Sports Law LLM. The forum provides a space for collaboration and discussion on issues at the intersection of law, public policy, the arts, and social justice. Thank you for your generosity towards the University of Miami and the law school. I'd also like to quickly thank the Hoffman Forum Working Group, consisting of Professor and Dean Emerita Patricia White, Professor, Distinguished Scholar, and Director of the Art Law Track for UM Law's Entertainment Arts and Sports Law LLM, Stephen Urice, Chief Curator and Director of the University of Miami's Low Art Museum, Jill Dupi, and Dean of Academic and Student Services and Director of UM Law's Entertainment Arts and Sports Law LLM, Greg Levy. Before we begin, please note that tonight's program will be recorded and will also qualify for Florida Bar Technology CLE credits. The recording will be emailed after the event, and I will drop a link in the chat for you to register for credit. I'd also like to remind and encourage our audience members to submit questions via the Q&A Zoom feature found at the bottom of your screen. The panelists will be answering questions throughout the panel discussion, so please submit your questions as they come up. Our event will end promptly at 8 p.m. So now, on to the fun stuff. It is my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Vivek Jayaram, founder and president of Jayaram Law and adjunct professor of the law school. Vivek advises today's most creative minds from diverse industries on intellectual property and, co and corporate law matters. Living up to his firm's tagline, Lawyers for Innovators, Vivek has wasted no time diving into today's creator-driven metaverse. He leads a law firm that is dismantling the perception of what law firms and lawyers should look like and is inspiring many along the way. It is with great pleasure that I hand the evening over to Vivek to introduce our panelists and lead our discussion. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Catherine, for, the, for that kind and warm introduction. And uh, thank you to the University of Miami uh, for putting this on. Uh, it's gonna be a really great night. And I'm really excited uh, to hear from our three uh, amazing panelists that we have here tonight. Um, and so let's start where I think kind of the only place you can start uh, with, a, with, a, with a topic like this, which is an introduction of the artist on the panel, um, my old friend, uh, Jen Stark, who is, uh, an extraordinary visual artist um, who's very difficult to describe her work. It's psychedelic, it's optical, it's magical, and it has evolved and transformed uh, in so many ways in the last about 20 years since I first met Jen, uh, when we were both early in our careers and we had uh, the opportunity to work together on some very interesting copyright issues uh, regarding her work. Um, so thank you, Jen, so much for being here tonight. Um, we're looking forward to, to hearing from you. Um, you more more recently, yeah, of course. And more recently, Jen, as many of you probably know, um, has had a, a lot of success exploring uh, the NFT, uh, the NFT um, <laughs> market, yeah, including her her drop of Multiverse, which was uh, a big success last year um, in March. And um, we're so happy to have you here. Thank you, Jen. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm so excited to be here. It's going to be a fun chat. And next, uh, I'd love to introduce another friend who um, is, is entered uh, the metaverse more recently, um, a very well-known gallerist from Palm Beach, um, Nicole McGraw, who actually, and she'll, I'm sure she'll get an opportunity to, to uh, exp, you know, talk about this a little more tonight, but who actually closed the doors of her uh, sort of IRL 
art gallery that she's had uh, on Worth Avenue for many years uh, in favor of uh, supporting artists and exploring some really interesting entrepreneurship in the NFT space um, with the creation of the Bungie project and other really exciting NFT projects that she's currently working on. And so, Nicole, thank you so much for, for joining us tonight. Thank you, Vivek. I appreciate you having me on here tonight and really excited to speak with the panel. Yeah. Okay. And finally, of course, um, who met many of you who um, are sort of uh, already into uh, the NFT world might uh, might be familiar also with with Stephen Kraus. Um, Steve is uh, I I want to say GC head of legal. You know, you're you're handling all the legal stuff for Dapper Labs, um, who have uh, sort of led groundbreaking NFT projects like Crypto Kitties and NBA Top Shot. Um, and uh, we're, I'm so happy to just have Steve on the panel tonight and, and have him share some of his expertise uh, in this space uh, with not only us and the panelists, but with the audience. And I think it's like a really good way to start the night to kind of hand it over to Steve for a moment, just to set the table on what the sort of legal landscape is um, with regard to, you know, the making and minting and selling uh, of NFTs. And then we'll get into um, a really good discussion on the topics that Catherine uh, referenced earlier. Sure. Well, thank you, Vivek. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'll give a quick and dirty intro uh, because uh, I think when you try to talk about what is available to talk about with NFTs, you could talk for an hour just about all of the different permutations. So I guess I'll start with, because I saw somebody in the chat say, hey, could you tell us what an NFT is? <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll run through that real quick so everybody has the right vocabulary, right? So an NFT is a non-fungible token. And you've seen probably a ton of jokes online. Right now, it's become quite a meme, like, boy, I used to funge, and now I can't funge anymore. And boy, that's a real unfortunate thing. Uh, but basically, the difference is that the dollar that's in your wallet is fungible. What that means is though I might have a dollar in my wallet and you have a dollar in your wallet, if we exchanged our dollars, we would each have exactly the same value, right? There's no difference. So dollars, so currency, as a, as a you know, matter of course, is by definition fungible. That includes cryptocurrency. And so it's very important for, for folks uh, in, in this environment to discern between, are you talking about crypto? When you talk about crypto, what do you mean? Are you talking about cryptocurrency, which is fungible? All tokens are fungible, crypto tokens. So Bitcoin, ETH, whatever it is. One Bitcoin that I own is the same as the Bitcoin that Jen owns. NFTs are by definition different. And it's that difference that makes the world so darn interesting. Um, a non-fungible token is a digital token that sits on a blockchain. It can be any blockchain. Uh, and that token is associated with some content. The, the, con the, the, the word that's used is hashed, right? But what it means is that the token itself calls to a thing. And that thing in the context of our discussion is the, the, thing, according, the, the, the thing that it's connected to uh, in, in the context of our discussion would be some form of intellectual property or art. Um, it doesn't have to be. Right. So NFTs are usable in a variety of contexts outside of the art space, but I won't go into that now. Right. The, the, the topic of our conversation is NFTs and art specifically. So let's imagine that you take a token, a digital token, uh, and you associate it with a piece of art, say uh, a, a, a painting that Jen uh, has painted uh, and made a digital version of. Right. Uh, then you have an opportunity because the blockchain establishes basically a, a, a trustworthy source of authenticity to be able to know that if Jen decides she wants to create only five, uh, five versions of this particular painting, that these are A, truly Jen's paintings, and that B, there's only going to be five that are ever going to be made because she is going to establish what's called a smart contract, which is basically a set of rules that underpin the token, that say, this, these are the rules that apply in this world with respect to this token. And so if you say, Jen, there are only going to be five made, there are only going to be five made. Um, now, the thing that's, that's particularly of use uh, when it comes to the art world and what makes NFT so interesting for a lot of artists is that if you go to the store 
and you buy, let's use an example. You go to the store and you buy a deck of, uh, uh, you buy a pack of uh, trading cards. Let's say uh, you go to buy baseball cards and you buy a deck of those cards. When you buy the cards, you pay $5. Uh, the, the pack, uh, the folks who develop the pack will owe a royalty to Major League Baseball right? Because they have taken the rights to Major League Baseball to create the photos that they put on the cards. And so those folks will get a cut. But what if Vivek is a baseball fan, sees that I have pulled from that pack a Barry Bonds rookie card, and Vivek really wants that. And I decide to sell that to Vivek for $100. Does Major League Baseball get a cut of that? No. In the NFT world, they can. In the NFT world, an artist can take the benefit of not only the primary sale, but also a cut of secondary sales, which is a very interesting opportunity for artists. The last thing I'll say before I turn it over, and I know I'm just sort of hitting highlights, and we can come back to lots of other pieces. NFTs are not all the same. Uh, the art that is offered that is hashed with NFTs and the rights that you are given in that art differ based on what the artist wants you to have. So an example of what we do at Dapper Labs, we work with the NBA and we have a product called NBA Top Shot. NBA gives us the rights to associate or hash uh, content. The content are, are clips from NBA games that are then minted, associated with NFTs and minted in rare packs. So you might see that there's a, you know, a particular LeBron James dunk that is particularly exciting, and there are only 75 of those in existence, right? But the rights that the buyer has are only for personal use. They can take that, you know, they can display it, they can show it, but could they, if they buy that LeBron James dunk moment, could they take a picture of LeBron James, put it on a t-shirt and sell it? No, because they don't have those rights. But it's, it's, it's an artist could grant you those rights if they own the intellectual property themselves. So that, I think, is something that will weave into this discussion when it comes into DE. When you're talking about DEI communities and the, opportunity that, the opportunities that NFTs present, one of the things I think is really important to highlight is the spectrum of license rights that are available to buyers of NFTs and how creators can use that spectrum yeah. to create, to drive interest, to drive value, uh, and, and to create buzz. I'll stop there for a minute. Yeah. No, thank you, Steve. I think um, you hit on one of them, and I think one of our uh, audience members hit on the second, maybe a second one, which is provenance. But I think you hit, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think the, the right for artists to uh, get a, a royalty on secondary sales right? As well as the um, importance of the blockchain to resolve issues of things like provenance and authenticity that we've all been dealing with in sort of the pre-blockchain world, right? Are two of the most, I think, critical components of sort of the NFT ecosystem as applied to creators like Jen, right? And the, and the artist, uh, Nicole, that, that you work with. So I think, so let's take a, let's take a step back here. So yeah, at the outset of this, Catherine identified, you know, a couple of big topics that that we're going to try to hit tonight. And I think the first is, does the emerging NFT marketplace encourage or facilitate greater access to the primary market for historically underrepresented, underrepresented artists um, and female artists uh, like Jen? And so, um, Jen, let me, let me turn to you and ask you a question. So how, I guess, I think in the, in the NFT game, right, I think you can make a, a, a pretty basic assumption that the sort of, you know, physical world, art world, gallery structure that we kind of have here, right, has generally been eliminated, right? And so how, how, has, um, how has that sort of uh, affected your practice as it relates to your NFT uh, drops? Mm-hmm. Um, well, yeah, historically, uh, women artists and artists of color, they, you know, they make up a tiny percentage of art sales. I think we were researching it was like 2% of fine art sales. Um, and I think I read somewhere that NFT sales, women represented about 5% of the sales, which is still super low. 
Um, so I think in the NFT world, the crypto world, people are trying to be more inclusive of artists and like of women artists and shining a light on it, but it's still not, you know, I want that number to be more like 50, 50. Um, and I think, I think we'll slowly get there, but I think just the fact that like the crypto community knows this is happening and they're trying to like, you know, support more artists and, um, women artists and people of color. I think that's an important start. Um, and then to jump back on that authentication thing, that was a great explanation, Steve. Um, I like to call my NF NFTs like a digital certificate of authenticity. So like with a, with a physical artwork, you like you have the artwork and there's like a certificate of authenticity that you give with it. But uh, in the NFT world, it's a digital one. So it's like written into the contract. You can always uh, connect it back to the creator. And I think that's a really cool part of this world. And like what, what Jen, do you think it is about this world that like perhaps makes it like a little bit more open and inclusive than maybe the experience you had back, you know, yes. in 2003, four five, when we were all in Miami and you were just trying to like, you know, make it as an emerging artist back then. Yeah. I mean, I've been in the fine art world for, uh, since like 2007 and, uh, there's definitely a lot of hurdles for people. It's, it's very like gated and closed off in a lot of ways. And, you know, some, uh, pretentiousness a bit and, just like ex exclusiveness, kind of like leaving people out of the picture. A lot of, you know, powerful and rich people control most of the art market. Um, in the NFT world, it's it's really exciting and interesting because it kind of like gives more autonomy to the artists and puts more freedom in our hands. Um, we get to have, uh, you know, a personal relationship with our collectors because we can we can see who's purchasing our work, like which wallet is connected and, you know, DM them on Twitter and have a relationship with them. And that's really awesome. Also, I love the fact that the royalties are just connected to your wallet. So in secondary sales, like when people sell my work, my NFTs on secondary, I'll get residuals. And that's like, you know, five to 10% of the sales. Um, in the fine art world, at least in the US, auction houses, the artists don't see um, any yeah. money usually on yeah. secondary sales. So that's right. a big part of it. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And I hear you on that too, right? Like it's, there's a second piece of it, which, yeah, it's true. You know, there's been a lot of lobbying, decades of lobbying, trying to get a, a secondary uh, resale royalty, uh, similar to the one that you see, you know, in France and England, and I think about 70 other countries in, in the world. Uh but you're right that like, even if you're able to negotiate that on like a deal by deal basis, somehow enforcing it is not nearly as easy as what has been sort of developed through the blockchain technology. And, and you know, so enforcing and collecting on those royalties, um, while maybe not as much of a pain in the visual art world as it is in the sort of music world, it, it, it could also be a problem if it were ever sort of implemented. So I think you're right that this is a very easy way to sort of drive, um, you know, additional sort of revenue for artists uh, who, who are making work and then have seeing it resell for higher prices, you know, so on and so forth down the line. Um, so on that point, Nicole, I, I have to ask you then, like, so as a former, you know, your, your story is so interesting to me because uh, you were in, you know, this sort of physical art world in a very, you know, working with contemporary artists, but you were in this in a traditional way in that you had a brick and mortar gallery for a long time, right? And, um, you know, in that gallery, I think you were showing works by many artists, including Brendan Murphy, who I think now you, you know, uh, collaborated with so successfully on the Bungie project. And so I guess as a former gallerist, uh, you know, were you nervous about entering a space that kind of maybe didn't work in the way that you know, with, with the gallery uh, sort of in between the audience and the artist, uh, sort of stripping that away, which is what you had been doing for years. How did that make you feel and what sort of inspired you to take that leap to jump into the NFT world, given that you were having success as a gallerist? When I started to learn about the technology, I was blown away by what it could do for the art world. So I was super excited to pursue the NFT space. And 
I talked to Brendan about it because I thought he would be one of the best artists I could think of to create an NFT drop with. So he said, listen, if you want to do this, you got to close the gallery and go figure it out. So I actually closed my gallery on Worth Avenue and I went, you know, head in. I jumped straight in and um, we created a Discord community for him. And overnight, we had 3,000 new people in there that were from all over the world and all different places, all different ages. And when he came into the Discord for the first time, he was blown away, you know, because he always said it was so hard to get eyeballs on his work and especially from people all around the world. So it was a tremendous opportunity and it just was like a snowball effect. It kept growing and growing every single day. So by the time we launched the NFT sale, there was 135,000 people in the Discord and they were all super enthusiastic about the art and it was a really cool experience. Very different from the traditional art world. And did you feel that from a community standpoint, like? as a female founder entering this, you know, brand new space, um, d- did you feel that the reception you received like on discord and elsewhere, you know, how was that different from say an initial reception you may get um, after sort of, you know, showing new works by new artists in, in an actual gallery? Like, uh, you know, h- how, how do you compare those experiences? Well, I think the traditional art world is a lot more stuffy, You know, and so I think other gallerists see you more as competition, but in the NFT space, it's much more inclusive. Everybody wants to help each other because they want this space to grow. So I got a lot of support and Brendan did as well as an art, you know, as the artist and uh, the community just got behind us and we love our community. Everything we do is community focused and it's, it's been an amazing ride. Yeah, you know, you, and you said something else a minute ago, which I'm sure a lot of the audience might might just be curious about. Um, you know, uh, Jen's work has has obviously transformed and also translated, I think, really well into the uh, NFT, you know, ecosystem or, or you know, the, or whatever you want to call it. You mentioned a minute ago that you thought almost immediately, I think, of Brendan uh, when you were trying to figure out who might be a good person to partner with in terms of your first drop, uh, NFT drop, there's probably a lot of like, you know, just contemporary art fans in the, in the audience tonight, many of whom I'm sure, uh, at least if I have some friends who have logged on, I'm sure there's some of them that think this, which is like, oh, you know, we love art. We love contemporary art, but I just don't get this art in the metaverse. Right. But why don't you talk for a second about what is it about Brendan and the narrative and the story and the spaceman that got you excited about showing that work, not in a gallery, not in, a, not in an art fair, but sort of in, in a digital world? Like, what, what was it about that work? Well, the Boonji Spaceman that he creates isn't really about space. Uh, he does the Spaceman because to him, it's taking the leap into the unknown. And he says, who embodies that better than these guys that are inside the spacesuit? Like, he thinks they're the bravest people in the world, and they're taking that step into the unknown. So that's what the Boonji Spaceman represents. And what we did was we took his 20 years of work, his entire catalog resume of paintings and sculptures from the physical world, and we translated them into digital copies that make up the Spaceman. So every single NFT that you see has a visor, a body, a background, and ears. And those all come from physical and, you know, physical paintings and sculptures of his work. So it was very well received because a lot of times in the NFT space, there's meme art or there's things that people don't really consider artwork. So I think that the true artists that are coming to this space get a lot of appreciation because they're really bringing value. And um, it's, it only, it doesn't just show up in the artwork. It also has utility. A lot of these artists um, present other things that the holders get to have by holding the artwork. And that's been another big part of collecting NFTs. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, community is a huge aspect of it. Right. And I think for those of uh, those in the audience who may not have, you know, maybe not haven't spent a lot of time on Discord or OpenSea or, or some of these other marketplaces and platforms, it's something that you, you know, whether you like it or not, it's something that you immediately recognize, right? That there is this great sense of community. And I think you said something earlier, which is just really interesting 
not just from an art perspective or even an NFT perspective, it's almost from like um, a, a, an entrepreneurial perspective, which is, you know, maybe there's a sense right now that everybody that it's easy to easier to build community with something so new because the possibilities are endless. And even though there may be some general competition, which, you know, you're saying you don't see a lot of, which I think I would agree with you. There's kind of everybody's rowing in the same direction in terms of everybody wants to see the space grow. Right. And I think that's a very unique moment uh, to be in any industry when that's happening, because that's when you can really, I think, um, see some really extraordinary innovation. Um, but no, thank you for that, Nicole. Steve, so let me let me turn to you for a second now. So, um, you know, your your background is different, obviously. You know, and and you know, both of us have had legal backgrounds and done a bunch of other things uh, in this in this legal space. But if the if the traditionally if the traditional art world, uh, you know, and, and the art world gallery was the, really the purpose of that is to connect artists with. A potential audience, right, or, or, or a group of collectors. Um, would you say that in some ways a, a company like Dapper Labs, and you know, there's others that are obviously doing that, um, kind of serve that function in the NFT space because you know you're not the creator, right? And and you know, it, it, but but you're kind of doing that. You're creating a project, and you're sort of acting as that uh, almost that 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 you know, bridge between the creator and ultimately the audience. Can I say yes with an and? Yeah, or, of course. You know, yeah, Anything it's, you want. It's, it's, answer however I you think that, is appropriate. And I also, I was intrigued by something that that you and Nicole were speaking about. So I'll touch on that briefly too. Sure. But the, um, around the differences between digital art and, you know, sort of real, <laughs> real art, uh, you know, and, and how that's viewed uh, in the market. But I think that the answer to your, to your specific question is, you know, I, I, w- I can't claim that, you know, our NBA top shot project or our newer ones, NFL all day, which is the NFL product or UFC strike, which just dropped last week, which is the UFC product that those are helping, you know, DEI communities, <laughs> to engage. I mean, these are big ticket intellectual properties that are trying to find a new way of getting sent, getting value out of their intellectual property. Yep. Right. And so I can't do it for a long time in different ways, which they've always, right. Everybody always tries. And this is a unique opportunity that's presented that they're trying to take advantage of. What I do think provides unique DEI opportunities and opportunities to smaller artists and emerging artists generally is the new blockchain that we created, which is called Flow. Uh, The Flow blockchain now has thousands of developers building on it that are interconnected. It's sort of the beginning of what people call the metaverse. You know, that name is used in a lot of different ways, but creating an infrastructure that allows easy access to new content creators to be able to share their content in a wide variety of ways and have it be viewed by an incredibly broad swath of people. Mm. I think that, and I'd be curious for Jen and Nicole's thoughts on this, but I think that ultimately is the goal, right? The, the, The goal is to make art accessible. And I mean, I'm a, I'm a singer songwriter when I'm not practicing law and I've got some of my music up on iTunes and like, boy, wouldn't it be nice if I had more access to people? Because I, I have folks all the time who come to me who are artists and friends of mine and say, well, I see everybody's making money on NFTs. Can I, you know, post my whatever on, you know, uh, and make an NFT of it? And can I get a million dollars now, please? And it, it, it leads one back to the problem that I think Nicole and Jen have highlighted, which is, I don't know if it's a problem or if it's endemic to the system. The first thing Nicole did was not to put Brendan's NFTs up for sale. The first thing Nicole did was create a market, was create a community. That's the key. The key is create, and, and what, what, all the, what blockchain does, what NFT technology does, is in my mind at least, is it expands the opportunity for creation of community, yeah. which, there, which thereby creates potential value for artists who are able to tap into it. Yeah. Okay, so you've the three of you have now each used two words, access and community, right? And I think that these are these are two concepts uh, that I think are really things that could help 
bring you know underrepresented artists into this community, right? If, if you're providing, if you're if if a goal, you know, uh, ecosystem wide is to provide access, and if the goal ecosystem wide is to build the sense of community, I do think that those are two things that you know just inherently will make this world much more inclusive than the physical art world, right? Um, but I think there's also, you know, uh, something else there, which is, I, I think that's why, you know, the two worlds are so different, right? And I think, you know, I, I'm, uh, all of us, I know Nicole, Jen, all of us, we're all big fans of the, the real art world too, right? But I do think all of us can agree access and community are not really like it, it's it's kind of like the opposite right you kind of are building um interest based on a lack of access and a lack of transparency and maybe you know and community is sort of not really in the discussion right in, in the same way that it is uh in the way that you see on on places like discord but um jen you know i read a a statistic that i think i shared with you earlier where more than $196 billion have been spent on art uh, at auction between 2008 and 2019, right? Of those $196.6 billion, only $4 billion, around 2%, okay, um, is work made by women artists, right? Um, I don't have currently, you know, reliable statistics for the NFT market, but um, in your experience, do you feel, you know, just between you and, and the other female artists that, you know, are in your community, um, do you feel that that those who have worked both in the physical world and now in the NFT market are finding more success or different kinds of success uh, in this ecosystem? Yeah, for sure. I think I think it helped that I was have been doing art for 15 years, you know, and I kind of came into the, this world. Um, a lot of people just like see this like instant success in the NFT and crypto world. And they're like, they got rich quick. Like they, yeah. but they don't see like the history behind our work and like the portfolio and all the work it took to get to this moment. So I think a lot of people need to realize that, that there's, you know, a lot of work that gets put in um, behind the scenes. But yeah, I mean, I've, I definitely try to buy more artwork by women, like more NFT artwork and try to like repost about it and, you know, get more support. And someone in the DMs, Jill, she's like, uh, how will we get there with, you know, helping support women and what's the strategy? And I don't really know yet, but I know that there are conversations around it in the crypto world and people are actively trying to lift women up, which is kind of different than the art world because it took a long time I think to mm -hmm. highlight that so people are realizing it and I think it's it's gonna happen <laughs> I hope but yeah I see I see another question in the in the chat that I'll I'll, I'll pose this to you Nicole um because you know you've been uh, both you and Jen but you've been so good at doing it how we, we we've now all talked about community a lot how do you build community? How do you build community for an NFT art project? Because that is something that uh, you hear about. And, you know, is it is it the same as building a community on a place like Instagram, like just getting a bunch of followers? Or is it different? Um, you know, where do you start? And, and what do you mean by that? Well, I think the main place to build community in the NFT world is on Discord. That's really the platform that everybody's building on right now. And you use things like Twitter to help. So you start sharing photos um, to get people interested in the artwork and you, you know, bring the artist in to really speak to the collectors, which is another really beautiful thing about this space. They, they get direct access to the collectors, the community, you know, so before Brendan didn't even know who he was selling his paintings to. They would sell through a gallery and then they'd be like lost forever. And like most artists, he has a real connection to these paintings. They're like his babies. So now he gets to speak to all of his collectors on a daily basis. He shares what he's doing in his studio. Um, he tells them about his personal life, you know, and it's like you create a real connection, which is so unusual and so beautiful at the same time. And um, I think that's the reason why these communities start to grow because it's so real. 
Um, you share the good, the bad, and the ugly. You know, there's a lot of stuff that happens. There's FUD. That's a term that where people come in and they start saying negative things, and then the community starts fighting them. And there's, you know, all kinds of stuff that goes on behind the scenes. But it's real life, and um, it's just such a strange and and unique world that we're living in. Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. And I think, and I think that's, um, I think something else that makes it unique, right? I mean, yeah. obviously a big skill, like anybody in your shoes, in Steve's shoes, in Jen's shoes can tell you if, if you have had a uh, successful NFT project, it's because you've done something to build community, right? right? And I don't know necessarily that that's the same way, that's the same thing could be said about sort of, you know, physical world art, um, that, that, that's not ne- like a necessary component to having, you know, a good sale at auction or something like that. Right. So I think that is, that is something that's, uh, that's unique. Steve, let, let me, um, so let's, let's, let's shift a bit here and and kind of go to the, the, the sort of second uh, topic that, you know, we, we wanted to cover tonight. Um, and, and, and I think that is, um, you know, has the emergence of NFTs encouraged, visual artists to cross over into new mediums of creative work, right? Um, which I think is a valid question. And Steve, I'll start, I want to start with you here because I've actually had this question for a while. You're the perfect guy to ask it to, um, which is like how much attention, see if I, if I talk to, to Jen or Nicole, I think it, it, although I'm sure that there is some level of separation between the physical world and digital world in terms of the art that they're making or collaborating with artists to make, there's, I'm sure still a part of it that's, just all part of their career because they've both been in the art world, generally digital or not for, you know, most of their adult life for, for a company like Dapper uh, and there, and there's so many uh, out there, right. That, that are just building, you know, marketplaces or just uh, creating new NFT projects. How much attention do you guys pay to what's happening in the sort of IRL art market uh, when you are, uh, developing new NFT projects for minting and selling. Is it at all something given a, a consideration of like, oh, this is what's happening in the art world this is what's selling at auction. This is something that people seem to like. And so maybe we're going to do something over here. Or is it something where you guys are like, we're we're just doing our own thing and it's completely different and we really don't pay any attention? Well, I think I'm going to come, I'm going to come to a, a roundabout way of answering your question. Yeah, sure. I think that the things that that Nicole and Jen are describing and that you highlighted, Vivek, around the importance of community, another word sort of occurred to me, and I know that one of our other panelists has said it, it's utility. The some For someone to spend money on a thing, and this is maybe a philosophical discussion, but I, won't, I promise it won't take long, for someone to want to spend their hard-earned money on a thing, it has to have value to them, right? There has to be some sort of utility. And, you know, for some utility varies from person to person. And as Nicole was describing, there is tremendous utility for people in being able to have direct access to the artist. Mm -hmm. There are other forms of utility that NFTs offer as well. Like when Kings of Leon offered, I think they were the first to offer their album as an NFT. And if you purchased the album as an NFT, as opposed to just normally on, on Apple or iTunes, what have you, you would get tickets to their next show that was in your area. Another wonderful example of utility is, you know, the, the, the meta, the, the more commonly understood metaverse idea, right? So if you've ever seen the movie ready player one, mm-hmm. uh, you know, imagine that you complete a quest in one game and by completing the quest, you win a special item. Let's say it's a, you know, fancy magic sword. Now in the normal, in the, in the normal gaming world, you can only use that sword in the game. You, maybe you could sell it to someone, but only within the game's marketplace. NFTs allow for the creation of other games that interconnect and that allow for the use, the use of NFTs in multiple locations. And so what if you could take that same NFT, that same sword, and offer it for sale on an open marketplace, and you could use it not just in the game that you played it in, but whoever bought it could use it in five other games as well. That creates additional utility. You could do the same with skins, avatars. There's any number. I mean, and, the, and this just scratches, barely scratches the surface right. of the types of utility that NFTs can offer. It really is based on creativity. 
And so when you ask, and I'll, to bring it back, like, do we pay attention to what's happening in the quote unquote real world when determining how to value things? I think I can safely say the answer is no. Yeah. <laughs> what we look to is whether people are excited about the possible utility that is presented by the thing. And, and by presenting, a, by, by not only creating, you know, these flagship products that Dapper has worked on, which are primarily sports at the moment, but will be expanding into entertainment and lots of other things with some of the big IPs, by creating the platform that I was describing on Flow, allowing anyone to build on it, allowing anyone to sell through it and build content with it, we're hoping that people will tell us what has utility. Yeah. Because we don't know. The only way we discover it is when people like Nicole and when people like Jen take chances, create those communities, come up with creative ways that implement utility that maybe we hadn't thought about yet. And that's where I think if you're asking me where the DEI opportunities are, it's there. Yeah. There's so much. It's, it's an open, open field. Yeah. I love that answer, Steve. I think that's, a, that's, a, that's, that's very well said and, and that's appreciated. And I, I think for me, and I see there's a couple questions in here. Um, you know, legal, quasi-legal questions. And I think I can maybe answer a couple of them just by saying this, which is the thing that I think is so poignant about what you're saying, and I think it's it's resonated throughout, you know, everything Jen and Nicole have said as well, is it's this place where I feel like creators have gone because the possibilities are endless and the restrictions uh, are also seem to be, you know, the, the restrictions are a lot less because we are now freeing ourselves of the power structures that have been in place, candidly, for hundreds and hundreds, thousands of years in the sort of physical art world, right? And the two examples I can think of, you know, with that and, and this, you know, in a legal context are as follows. And in your discussion of flow, Steve, you know, made me think of this, which is one we've already talked about, which is, look, the laws here don't allow for this uh, resale royalty for artists, right? So what did artists do? They did what they've always done. They took matters into their own hands and they solved the problem, right? They they went into the metaverse and they said, fine, we'll just create a smart contract and we'll do what all you people in Congress won't do for us, right? And so they did that. Um, I also think, you know, another clever thing, which is which has popped up, uh, you know, with Bored Ape and now many others is this idea of, you know, in the in the real art world, you know, it's like, OK, you know, artist makes a work, artist sells a work, artist retains the IP, the collector gets to hang it up in their house or, in a, you know, ultimately loan it to a museum or whatever. But at the end of the day, you know, the artist, you know, kind of keeps the IP and the, the collector buys the piece. Well, now we're seeing all these other crazy structures allowing the collectors to commercialize the IP of the art that they bought. Right. And, you know, if we just take a look at, you know, even Jen's screen and we see like the kind of work she makes, I mean, you can only imagine the, um, the sort of both empowerment, but then also the uh, concept of community and inclusion really inspiring anyone telling anyone you can be an entrepreneur and here, I'll give you this awesome IP to use to like, to, to help do this. Now, I'm not saying that this is good or bad or, or anything else other than it's just a, a vehicle to create what seems to be endless possibilities. Can, can I jump in there really sure, quick? Absolutely. Because it's, it's, it. it's basically, it's creating additional utility, right? What you're yeah, describing exactly. is creating additional utility. And yep. just to throw it back, like our first big project was CryptoKitties. And to give you a sense of just how nuts it was, we thought it would be a fun idea to draw pictures of cats, associate those pictures of cats with a genetic makeup to create rarity, different rare ears or eyes or whatever. And when you breed the cats, you get new cats based on the mix of genetic material that creates a new picture. And because we owned the pictures of the cats, we had a choice about the rights we would give in the buyers, right? And what we did is we decided we wanted to allow buyers of our NFTs to be able to commercialize the art that they bought to some degree. And we included that in our contract, said you can actually put it on a t-shirt, yeah. sell it, yeah. you know, do your thing, right? And that it's, it's a very unusual way of thinking about making and distributing art. And for those of us who are, for those people out there, I can't count myself amongst them, but for those artists amongst them, amongst us who are willing to be creative and to really think outside the box, it presents incredible opportunities. Yeah. Um, 
Okay. So let, let's, let, let me ask you this, Jen. Um, so again, for a lot of people out there who are just trying to like figure out what this space is all about, how, how do you, you know, how do people get started in this as an artist in, in working in this medium? When did you first hear about NFTs as an artist and how did you decide, and we're talking about like, has, has, has this new medium sort of inspired you and others to sort of cross over from, you know, this sort of sculptural works and paintings that you were doing, you know, now into this digital work, which obviously it has inspired you to do that. But when did you first hear about, uh, you know, a non-fungible token? Um, because as one of our uh, questions is in the chat here is, you know, hey, they've been around for years, you know, when did you first hear about them? And secondly, when you decided that you wanted to do this, um, what role did your physical works play in sort of inspiring your digital works? And how did you sort of look at exploring this new medium uh, in that way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I guess, answer the DM question first. The yeah. why, are, why are NFTs popular only now? So yeah, since 2017, um, you know, NFTs were on the blockchain and I didn't really hear about them until uh, earlier 2021, like January, February. Um, and I think it might have been uh, their popularity might have been increased because of COVID and also the increase in like Ethereum and Bitcoin. It was just kind of skyrocketing. So the people that invested early in it kind of had all this extra money they wanted to support and just, you know, get in the game. So um, yeah, I think just being being kind of like trapped in our homes, like during COVID, I think it made us go inside and like stare at our screens a lot. And I think that kind of helped mm -hmm. spur it. Um, Interesting. Yeah. I also compare it to like, you know, COVID as kind of the dark ages. And then after that is a, re a renaissance, you know, so like NFTs are kind of like the digital renaissance that's like blooming now, even though COVID hasn't ended yet, but <laughs> it's still <laughs> happening. Um, so yeah, I heard about NFTs. I I had been dabbling in animation and digital digital animation for a few years. So I decided to just jump jump right in head first and I launched my first one in March of 2021 and it did really well. And um then have been like making drops throughout the year and it's just for me it's like a new avenue of art history it's um mm -hmm. a new medium it's just like at first the art the fine art world didn't want to accept it they're like this is not real art like what is this and they were you know the, the big art critics were kind of poo-pooing on it uh but now I think people are like starting to accept it and I think that's really interesting um, and also like the utility aspects of it, like I can, I can, um, you know, give like whoever invests in my NFTs, I can give them special access to things or like give them like, uh, special access to merch where they can like connect their NFT to my store. I haven't set this up yet, but just saying an example where like you get these extra benefits and like it helps grow your community and stuff. Um, yeah. And then the physical crossover, what was that question again? I was just curious, you know, did you, did you like, did your, obviously your physical work has some inspiration, you know, whether directly or indirectly on what you sort of decide to make digitally, but, you know, I think, do you feel like what role did that play? Like, did your existing body of work play in terms of like deciding yeah. what direction you wanted to take with your digital art? Yeah, I wanted, I mean, my, my career sort of my artwork kind of has like a similar theme running through it of like vortexes, um, black hole, psychedelic color. So I wanted to like continue that theme with it. So yeah, the paintings and sculptures inform the NFTs um, I just did a, a drop with Art Blocks. That's a generative project, and for that we we kind of based the inspiration off my earlier paper sculptures, which are these like super intricate, just like exacto paper cuts that I created. Um, so yeah, they just they kind of inform each other, and it's really interesting to keep evolving through NFTs. Yeah, 
Cool. Um, all right. I, I see a couple. There's a few questions. I mean, I'm going to turn back to Steve for a second here for this. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not an easy topic, uh, but I think, you know, be curious to hear your thoughts on it. There's a couple of questions in, in, in here just talking about the potential environmental impact of, you know, minting NFTs and uh, the, the, the crypto market generally and mining Bitcoin and things like that. So, Look, we're not looking for a, a solution from you, Steve, but I'm curious, what what are your thoughts uh, on this? I'm sure Dapper, you know, has has, has thought about this. It's, it's uh, tonight is not the first time that this issue is being raised. Uh, it's It's been a hot issue, I think, for probably the duration of the pandemic. And what are your what are your thoughts on how the industry can deal with something that is obviously, you know, so important um, not to not just to those uh you know, in the crypto world, but really to anybody living on this planet. Sure. So what I first, what I first have to, I have to caveat my answer, which is that there are others at Dapper who would be better answering this question than, than I am. Uh, my role at Dapper is primarily to draft, negotiate, think about the deals that we do. Uh, and so while I have some tangential understanding of this, please take what I, whatever I am about to say with a little <laughs> yeah. bit of a grain of salt. So first and foremost, the re I think it's important, again, to recognize the distinction between cryptocurrency, mining currency, and the creation of an NFT. Those two things are different. Uh, and there are different ways of creating those, you know, when you're mining, when you're, when, you're, when you're basically, when you're creating the chains, the links in the chain that make up the chain, a little bit of energy gets used. The question of how much energy depends on the nature of the blockchain itself and the structures that are required in order to establish what they call consensus. Now, the, all I can, what I can say is that we take the environmental impact seriously and that the flow blockchain is built to enable the building of consensus at far lower sort of cost economically than other chains. Um, you know, and so that's what, that's what we've tried to do. Uh, you know, and so in our, from, from our perspective, what we're trying to do is to create these opportunities for artists and for other content producers and creators, while at the same time, not harming the environment. Uh, if we want to get into more detail on it, then I can pull that, I, I can take that question offline uh -huh. and I can get you a better answer so that folks who really want answers to those questions, I can provide you with the right places to look. Yeah, no, great. Thank you. I pre it, 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 it's a difficult issue and I appreciate you taking a swing at it. Um, I see a couple other questions here and boy, it's a hot, hot chat here. So hold on, I'm trying to catch up to catch up to everybody. But Nicole, let me let me uh, let me pose this one to you, because uh, in getting to know you, I've just been so impressed by your knowledge of this NFT market, how it works, how it fluctuates, um, how to sort of manage uh, you know, supply and demand, you know, which are not easy things to to manage with such not just volatility, but volume and, um, you know, in, in, in a market like this. Um, so um, how do you, you know, we obviously without disclosing any anything that you don't want to disclose about your your, your actual projects, but how, how do you decide where to set prices on NFTs? And, and, yeah, and how at all is it different from how you decide to set prices for selling a sculpture in your you know, former Worth Avenue gallery? Yeah, that's a great question. So with the Boonji project, we looked at what Brendan's sculptures and paintings were selling for, and that was kind of a starting point. And we wanted to lower the price so that it was more accessible for people to be able to enter. And I think that's one of the great things about the NFT space is it's a lot more accessible financially um, for, for you to jump in and start dabbling in the art world. And it's also a lot more liquid. So if you decide that it's not something you want to keep, you're able to sell it much easier, which is another added bonus. Um, but back to the pricing point. So we, we came up with a base price and then we had 1,111 NFTs that we were going to sell in our drop. So um, we did something called a Dutch auction that starts at a higher point price point, and then it lowers to the resting place and people can decide where they want to jump in. And the first 200 people got a physical sculpture with the NFT. 
So one of the things that we wanted to do in our drop is we wanted to bridge the digital and the physical. And Brendan wants to give people who wouldn't be able to afford his pieces through a gallery an opportunity to own them by owning his NFT. So that's one of the utilities for Boonji Project is getting in real life art from Brendan. So, you know, those are some of the things that we thought about initially and we're still continuing to think about. But the one thing that's blown me away that I'm totally surprised about in this space is we thought that people really wanted the physical art. And what we're learning is people really want the digital art. Yeah. They would rather have a digital sculpture that they can put in their digital home than an in real life sculpture that they can put in their physical home. And I know that sounds absolutely crazy, but it's the truth. So now we're coming up with concepts around um, having drops for digital paintings and digital sculptures that people can put in their digital homes. Yeah, I think a real aha moment for me at one point was at some point in the pandemic, um, I believe it was in Wired magazine, I think it was an editor's note, uh, he was talking about the aha moment for him with NFTs, which was when his uh, teenage daughter, um, who was asking for a Chanel bag for her birthday or Christmas or just in general, I can't remember, um, it, she kind of uh, pivoted and said, you know, dad, I'd actually like the Chanel NFT. And so he said, okay, gets on a, you know, the gets on the marketplace and the Chanel NFT was actually $200 more than the actual bag. And he said to her, he's like, I'm happy to buy you the bag. Why wouldn't you just want the bag? And she goes, why would I want a bag that nobody can see when I can have a bag that everybody can see? Right. And, uh, you know, if you kind of think deeply about that for a moment, I think you can kind of begin to understand sort of a little bit about why we are where we are, you know, today. And so, Steve, I got your 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 note in the chat, which I think you're right. Um, so many people here asking about asking about this, right? Like, why on earth would you buy an NFT when you could buy real art, right? I think we heard a couple of minutes ago, and Steve, I'm going to turn you in a second, but I think we heard uh, a set, you know, a few minutes ago, Jen talk about. Um, you know, I think you gave such a such a uh, sort of beautiful explanation, Jen, of where you see NFTs fitting into our history, right? And I have not heard you uh, say, and nor do I think you believe that you're never going to make a painting or a sculpture or a beautiful paper sculpture like the one I have of yours that I love. Um, I I've never heard you say you're not going to do that. Similarly, Nicole, I was with Nicole and, and Brendan last night. I don't think Brendan's going to stop making spaceman sculptures or, you know, other real, uh, you know, physical objects. And I would even say for me, you know, I've been uh, co collecting art for, for most of my uh, adult life. And I think, you know, it would be uh, tantamount to me saying, oh, I'm only collecting paintings. I'm not going to buy photographs anymore. Um, you know, that that's how I kind of look at, oh, I'm, you know, like that's not how it works, right? Like NFTs are just another medium of art and you can enjoy those alongside paintings, alongside sculptures, alongside, you know, mixed media works. So I don't think it's uh, an either or um, kind of thing. Steve, what do, you, what do you think about that? Oh gosh, well, I think that you, you all just sort of partially at least answered the question right off the bat with Nicole's uh, description of how uh, Brendan thinks about this. I think that's really interesting, and I'm going to have to steal it and 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 borrow it when I'm talking <laughs> with folks because that's fascinating. And the story about the bag is really interesting. I mean, the question I get all the time is, why would I spend a hundred dollars on a moment, an NFT of a you know LeBron James dunk, when I could watch it for free online? And, you know, so when you're dealing with art that has been placed online, and maybe Jen, I'd be curious for your thoughts on this, because if you put one of your pieces online or digital, nothing is preventing anyone from taking a copy of it and putting it on their screensaver and enjoying it for free. So why should anybody buy digital art at all? Right. And that, I think, is the basic question. Why would you spend money on something that you could get for free to begin with? And I mean, the answer, I think, is you, you, I think it, it's been highlighted by the bag idea. It's there's people, people like to know they own the real thing, the authentic thing, the thing that they have a direct relationship with for all kinds of reasons. 
right? It's, it's imagine that you could go to a store and you could buy a soccer ball for $10. Would you pay more for the exact same soccer ball that Messi kicked to win the World Cup? Probably. Is there a reason why you would? Like, can you explain that? <laughs> like, no, it's the same ball, right? But there's value in owning the thing that is real. And so I challenge, I see a lot of folks have really good questions around what's the difference? What, why digital art? Does it mean anything if everybody in the world can see it? I would argue it means more to own the authentic thing the more people in the world can see yeah. it. The more people in the world see it and love it, the more owning the authentic one, the more value holding the authentic one has. Yeah, and I'd love to jump in at that point. I think that's one of the reasons that the PFP, the profile pictures have become so popular um, in the NFT space and they're selling for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. It's because when you change out your profile picture, you're showing the world that you own that. And people take a lot of pride in this digital space being part of that community, whether it's board apes or crypto punks, it's basically like a status symbol to them. And that's become one of the really big things in this space is being able to show that you're part of that community or that you mm -hmm. own that digital asset. So I completely agree with you, Steve. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm going to turn it over to Jen for, uh, for a second on that, but I, I want to respond to what Nicole and Steve just said, because I've gotten that question a lot too, Steve, about like, you know, why do you, why do you buy this digital art? I, I thought you like real art, right? That kind of a thing. And this idea of like, well, I could just, you know, I could just right click, right? Or whatever. And, and I think the answer to that is all of us already know the answer to that. We've been living in this forever, right? Just think about this. Like I grew up in Chicago, you know, go to like the Art Institute, right? At the end of walking through that museum, okay, as when you've seen all these wonderful works, uh, these one of one works, right? Uh, where do you go at the end? The gift shop where they are selling prints of all of those works, right? And you can buy those for 20 bucks, right? So that has been going on uh, for a long time. And so I would say that the 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 same, you know, the, the, the idea of, um, you know, Oh, I can just take one of Jen's NFTs and put them on my computer. Well, yeah, I could also go buy the Picasso old guitarist print and frame it and hang it on my wall. Like it's just different, right? And we've all agreed it's different for a long time, which is why those prints are sold for 20, 30, 100, a few thousand dollars, whereas the originals are many millions of dollars, right? So I, I think if we all step back and look at, I think part of the problem people have is they are unable to sort of, um, credit NFT as art. But I think when you finally make that very basic assumption, which I think we all have to do, a lot of other things fall into place. Uh, Jen, what are, your, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's, you know, everybody's like, I can just right click and save this or screen grab it. But, um, you know, you can take a picture of the Mona Lisa, but you don't own it. Um, but with NFTs, like the, the NFTs are connected to uh, a smart contract. And that's like, uh, you know, a form of the true form of like authenticating it and like connecting it to the artist. So it's like this super transparent way to to know it came from the artist. And um, yeah, for me, it's just like digital certificate of authenticity. I yeah, that's the only way I can put it easily. But. And digital scarcity as well, right? Because now with through the blockchain, you can show that there's only one of your paintings or your your NFTs, or you can say there's five of them and you can show that that's the scarcity. So if people want to buy those, there's only five available to buy. And I think that's another thing that people really like about blockchain. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, um, okay, let's take a look. We've got so many more questions here. Uh, and we've only got a few minutes left, so I want to make sure I at least get to to some of them that that seem to be uh, burning here. So, um, okay, let's talk for a minute about this. Is something I think again, I'll, actually, everybody here, including myself, probably has has experienced this or, or dealt with it. Let's talk a little bit about fakes and counterfeiting, right? Um, there has been a lot of talk about you know, fraudsters and counterfeiting um, of NFTs, right? Um, I think all any of us who would say that that's not a problem would probably not 
you know, be completely truthful about, about the reality of that situation. Um, when people ask me about this, I am quick to remind them that um, we might all remember the most expensive real painting that was ever sold, right? Which was the Salvatore Munti, which I think sold for somewhere near half a billion dollars, maybe $450 million, not that long ago. And, you know, there's been great books and documentaries uh, written about that whole story. But on the eve of that sale, um, if you'll all recall, there were teams and teams of experts uh, in Europe debating all the way up until the sale uh, about whether or not that work was authentic or not. Right. Um, and so I, I would begin by saying, let's talk about this in terms of NFTs. But this is a extra, an extraordinary problem that's been in the real art world for as long as the art world has existed. Right. So this is not necessarily a problem that is unique to the NFT market. And as Steve explained at the outset of this uh, so articulately, you know, one of the big sort of uh, benefits of, of, you know, working and, and making and selling NFT art is that the blockchain does a lot to help curb issues of providence and authenticity. Um, but that being said, um, you know, uh, Nicole, you know, I, I know you've had some experience uh, dealing with this on, uh, you know, on various marketplaces and maybe elsewhere. Um, how do you, and I'm sure you've also seen, seen it and dealt with it in, you know, your, your, prior job and your prior career of like the real world art, art practice. So how would you describe, you know, the state of this uh, in your experience, um, you know, working with artists on NFT projects? I think the biggest problem right now with the NFT space is that a lot of people don't know how to use Discord and how to buy cryptocurrency. And so there's a lot of people playing off of that. So they'll send fake links to the web, so different websites that they skin. So you think you're going to a website to buy an NFT and they change, you know, a few of the letters and they send you, redirect you to a different website. And so people buy fakes and then there's really no way to get your money back. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. 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 I mean, so, I, mean I, I, I think anything where, you know, people, uh, you know, selling copies or, you know, misrepresenting that they are a certain creator, right? And things like that. Yeah. Um, I think the one good thing, like we've been saying, is that through the blockchain, if it's the real artist, you can show that that's who it is. It's just people that are sending in bots and counterfeiting with fake sites. Those, that's the real problem. And I think there'll be some solutions soon through the technology. Yeah. Jen, what about you? Have you um, have you experienced you know these kinds of problems in in your NFT work? Um, yeah, for sure. Um, especially like safety and um, like there was there was a project that was uh, uh, it was called Alien Friends. Their Discord was like a hacker came into it and like was like we're doing a surprise minting tonight, and it was a, a website that redirected you to like mint this like special series of alien friends and you know a lot of people fell for it so there's a lot of those sort of things where like luckily that wasn't malicious and people just lost money but uh the hackers didn't actually empty the the victims wallets they just you know lost a little bit of minting money um right. yeah there's there's all sorts of scams and stuff that go around um me myself i haven't really experienced too much like nft related stuff but it, it brought to mind my friend uh matt fury who does pepe the frog oh yeah yeah he's been on a crazy adventure um so he created this i'll, I'll drop it in the chat the wikipedia uh pepe the frog it was in one of his comic books and um years ago it was like became a meme on the internet and i'm sure everybody has seen it um, and eventually a hate group kind of like took it over as their mascot. Um, and now like he just lost total control of it on the internet and it was just, you know, out of his control. And now through the NFT world, he's, there's still a lot of counterfeits of it, but now people can know like if, if it's a Pepe that's coming from his wallet and it's his animation, they can, they can go into the blockchain and like see it. And it's, it's just authenticated through him and um, yeah, it's helping him like reclaim Pepe. So there, yeah. yeah, there's all these interesting things. 
Awesome. Swimming around. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And I think that's one thing. And I've seen, a, 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 you know, little bits and pieces in the chat here, questions about this. Like, it's not that there are, you know, people always say like, oh, but it's completely lawless, this NFT world. You know, there's no laws that apply. It's like, well, yeah, no, I mean, you know, we, we do have a Copyright Act and a trademark statute and everything that that can apply to these kinds of activities. I think the difficulty sometimes is sort of tracking and finding who's doing what. Right. I mean, I think that's a, a bit of the challenge. Um, Steve, what has I, I, I'm sure Dapper, I mean, you've got such um, high profile, very sort of public uh, projects, you know, the, the, especially the ones with the with the major sports leagues, as, as well as crypto kitties. I mean, what? But you've also obviously been practicing law well before all of this sort of, you know, uh, w- was possible. So, have you dealt with sort of fraud and counterfeiting sure. of your? Yeah, assets? of course. And how would of you kind course, of compare of that course. to what you might maybe saw just in in the non digital world? I actually, I mean, I would, I would actually frame the conversation a little differently. Okay. I think that counterfeiting your, your, <laughs> it's going to sound strange, but if someone is counterfeiting your stuff, it means you're probably doing something right. <laughs> right. People don't, the only reason people try to counterfeit stuff is because it's already worth something and they're trying to ride the coattails and take advantage of it. I wouldn't. I, I I know a lot of uh, new artists or emerging artists who are so frightened of having their work being taken and and something else done with it. And I continue to remind them that that is the best case scenario. <laughs> that people care about your stuff enough, and that they see your stuff enough, and that they want your stuff enough to fake it and to try to make money off. That's a good problem to have. And, you know, it's a problem that's going to be, and it's not just the digital world that has this problem. Any, any, anything successful, some people are going to try to come in and make an easy buck until they're not able to, and then they'll move to the next thing. Yeah. So I agree that it's an issue and we deal with it as we can sort of on a case by case basis. But I certainly wouldn't, if I were an emerging artist listening and participating in this chat, I would not let that get in the way of jumping in. I would jump in fast. And if you're doing something well enough that people want, that people want to counterfeit it, it means you're doing something right. Yeah. (laughs) Well, thank you, Steve. And I'm looking at the clock here. I think we're, we're pretty close uh, to wrapping up here. So I guess I'll just, you know, to piggyback on it and and, and what I think everybody has said, I think, um, and if we look at the the sort of title of, of tonight and sort of what people have been asking me for the last few weeks and months, and probably all of you too, you know, I don't think that the NFT market, um, it's a question of whether uh, it's like a real thing or if it's going to be here, you know, or anything like that. I think the ship has sailed on sort of uh, questioning the 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 existence and sort of staying power of this new medium uh, that that many artists and creators are working in. Um, I think it's more of figuring out what what kinds of projects um, you know will be will 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 continue to sort of be interesting what other chances will artists take in this medium and you know what direction will the entire sort of ecosystem go into um, once we have all sort of become more comfortable and sort of learned a little bit more about the really expansive technologies um, that have been developed and that are you know continuing to be developed to help uh, creators uh, make really uh, sort of interesting NFT projects. So, Jen, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Nicole, thank you so much. And thank Steve, um, great to hear everything uh, that you guys all have to say. Um, let me just turn it back to Catherine uh, to sort of close out tonight. And thank you all so much for, thank you to the, to the panelists for the discussion and to the audience for all of your insightful questions. We're so sorry we couldn't get to them all, but there were so many. Um, but also just a quick reminder that we're going to email the recording to all the registrants and a quick shout out to Steve and Vivek. They both teach courses at UM. So if you're any a student in the audience, definitely try and, and register for their class. Um, as Greg just kind of popped into the chat that Steve's class was actually the first um, ever NFT legal course in the country. Um, I really loved it. And it was, I mean, 10 out of 10, I really recommend. Um, so just final close with a, a thank you to Deborah and Larry Hoffman for their generosity in, in putting together this conversation. And, and thank you, everyone, and, and have a great night.